book of the Genesis in the Bible. In the beginning was the spirit, and it was from this spirit that the material abundance of creation issued forth. But progress is not foreordained. The key is freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of information, freedom of communication. Freedom is the right to question and change the established way of doing things. It is the continuing revolution of the marketplace. It is the right to put forth an idea scoffed at by the experts and watch it catch fire among the people. God bless you. That the task which has been set us is not above our strength. That its pangs and toils are not beyond our endurance. As long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, salvation will not be denied us. Liberty is not built on the doctrine that a few nobles have a right to inherit the earth. No! No! By the unalterable, indefeasible laws of God and nature, as well entitled to the benefit of the air to breathe, light to see, food to eat, and clothes to wear as the nobles or the king. That is liberty. And liberty will reign in America. Welcome to politicalvindication.com on the air, brought to you by the CB Media Network. My name is Frank, and I'm here with Shane, and like we do every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're here to do our part to make the, to make the reign of Barack Hussein Obama a one-term phenomenon. Tonight, we welcome Tim Grossclose, author of the book, Left Turn, How Liberal Media Bias Distorts the American Mind. Mr. Grossclose will be here to give us his in-depth study on media bias, and we'll ask him to explain which political ideology the mainstream media favors and why. Mr. Grossclose will join us in just a few minutes. You're listening to Political Vindication Radio. We're here every Tuesday. We're on for two hours, 5 to 7 p.m. Broken Coast time. Frank and I, we're conservatives. Uh, we deal with politics, history, culture. Uh, we do so because we give, a, we give a damn about our country and where it's going. We're in a giant battle right now. Frankly, that battle's been going on for a long time. And so it's a joy to bring on somebody who is following the undercurrents and where a lot of the influence and those those forces that shape how people think are are found or the created here the inspiration for those that man here tonight with us and what a treat is professor tim grossclose uh, marvin hoffenberg professor of american politics at ucla he's written a book called left turn how media bias distorts the american mind and he's not kidding we talk about it all the time on here and i want to Welcome, uh, Professor Grossclose, for joining us here on Political Vindication Radio. Jane, thank you. Great to be here. Awesome, awesome. Sir, we've, you've set out to prove what's been a bruising debate in America for a long time. Here on the right, we're pretty sure there's been an activist left working through our media. And frankly, our, our education system for a long time. So our reaction has been to confront it with kind of conservative outlets of our own. And I'd argue that we're far more honest about that than the left is, you know, labeling ourselves. But, and maybe it's the brass ring of professional objectivity that's kept the media from admitting its bias, as we see it. Uh, but uh, like we see with Eric Alterman, which you write about in your book, fighting furiously to defend them and that objectivity or whatever he sees of it. So tell me, Professor, what's the purpose of your book? Are you trying to confirm the obvious? Or open the eyes of the skeptical, or is there something more? <laughs> you know, yeah, I have to say, yeah, there's some conservatives that have told me, oh, next thing you do, you're go you're gonna write a book telling us the sun rises in the east. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, <laughs> the point is, I, I think in some ways, actually, this was kind of a conflict with my editors. They were telling me that. You know all these chapters. You're you're like you're writing this toward the, the left wingers. You know, and I'm not sure that's going to be your audience. Well, I hope it is. I hope they will will read it. And um, uh, but 
the, on the other hand, you know, the, I think first conservatives are going to read this, and, and they're going to see like, well, yeah, I approach this in a social scientific way. This is with data and these standard statistical methods, and I show using those methods that, yeah, basically the conservatives have been right on this, that uh, basically every news outlet that, that I examine is left of center. And then I'm hoping maybe, you know, once conservatives start saying, yeah, see, look, here's the book, and tell their liberal friends, and, you know, some of those chapters that I've addressed to the left-wingers, maybe um, I can convince some of them. Probably not, but you never know. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you how you prove this, Professor. And I want to start with PQ, a political quotient. Okay. Now, right. now, friends, in the chat room, you know I sent you over there today through Facebook over to take your test. I hope you all brought your numbers with you so we can find out how liberal you all are. But, Professor, I want you to talk about a political quotient, PQ. It's a number found on a spectrum that traces an ideological line from conservative to liberal. Could right. you tell us about the process you use to create the quotient and why it's credible? Okay. Well, uh, first, uh, I should say that I don't pick the questions. I let the Americans for Democratic Action pick the questions for me. This is a, a liberal interest group that has existed since 1947. It's an interest group that we political scientists often use as a to use as a measure of the liberalness of politicians. And so um, every year they've got a, they give a score to these politicians. Now, there's a little technical adjustment that I had to do to make the uh, scores comparable over time. I had to do something just as a um, professor, if he wants to make two tests equally difficult, he might have to curve one test. And so I had to do that with different years. And this was based on a peer-reviewed article. It was it was done with Steve Levitt, the um, uh, free economics author, whom I met when, when Steve was just a grad student. We wrote this a long time ago. Uh, based on that article, I've computed uh, constructed these PQ scores. So uh, the questions all come from roll call votes in Congress. Uh, they were chosen uh, by the Americans for Democratic Democratic action. They choose about 20 or so every year. And if anyone uh, wants to compute their own political quotient, I've put I've used the questions from 2009, put them on my website, and uh, timgrossclose.com, anyone can compute their score. But uh, the great thing, because there are congressional roll call votes, I have the PQ of every single member who's ever served in Congress. And so on this scale, I've estimated that uh, Michelle Bachman is about a zero on this scale. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, Barney Frank, they're about 100 on this scale. And uh, by my estimates, the average voter in America is just about exactly 50 on this scale. So uh, I invite everyone to you know compute their own quotient. And on my website, actually, so here are the politicians who are near your PQ. Okay. Yeah, so let me say real quickly, friends, www.timgrossclose.com slash famous. Dash PQS slash. Uh, you've got it in the chat room. You're going to see it on our website. It was there today as well. Go take the test. Go take the test. Frankie? Yeah, um, Mr. Uh, Grossclose, this is Frank, the other half of Political Vindication. I want to welcome you. Uh, thank you, actually, for coming on tonight. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. I, you know, I took the test today myself, actually. Um, I'm right there with Michelle Bachman. Scored a three. Unbelievable. Okay. Oh, you okay. whack job. Okay. I'm a right wing <laughs> whack job. Unbelievable. But I, but I do have a question about the the particular questions you selected. I saw a lot of questions about the economy, domestic policies, especially health care, and uh, and uh, you know a lot of domestic policies. Why wasn't there more questions about foreign policy in your in your Oh yeah, you know. Well, again, you know, I have to say that it's the fault of the Americans for Democratic Action. You know, I think 2009 was just a weird year. I think because of, you know, the recession that they. It seemed like there was a just a lot, a lot of questions on the economy, and it seems like not as many on things like abortion and other social policy. So I think if I, I could have put in more years, and, and I just I love. People might prefer more recent stuff to earlier. Um, once I have more time, I may try to put up more right. questions, but uh, okay. that may be just a quirk of the year. Right. Um, okay, one more point I want to bring up. You say that the average Americans are like right around a 50.4. On page 17 of your book, you write, um, I'm reading the chart here, if I'm reading this correctly, the average voter uh, from 1995 through 1999 is actually more conservative than the average American from 1974 to 1994. Does that mean the average American has become more conservative? Uh, yes. 
Uh, yes. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. So if you look at, yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the average American voter. It seemed to like, kind of hit a height of liberalness just after Watergate. It seems like everyone mm. moved left, okay. Okay. and then around 1980 started moving, and then 1994 uh, voters moved again to the right. But if you look at the longer view, um, before 1970, uh, the voters had been uh, trending uh, much more liberal. So like. The, the late 1940s, uh, voters were pretty conservative, and they just kind of kept getting more and more liberal till you know about 1975, and then slightly back uh, toward conservativeness. Yeah, it's interesting because as you're looking at the list here, Ron Paul, who's a constant conversation on our show, we're not big Ron Paul fans, but uh, but we love to discuss who's standing on the stage and debating and with issues. And you see Ron Paul on here is a 31.8. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, around Ron Paul, uh, Rick Lazio, um, Jack Kemp, uh, Joe Scarborough. And it's interesting because you would think that foreign policy being an issue, I know Frank just talked to you about that here, on on domestic issues, he's a libertarian. He's a libertarian right. on foreign policy mm-hmm. issues here. And when I look at your spectrum, Professor, it's interesting to me because when we talk about conservatism going toward, if you want to call it progressivism, how do you see the spectrum does it go? Does it go cons- like 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 totalitarian conservatism, libertarianism, oh. liberal oh, progressivism, right. anarchy? I mean, is there a oh well, right? Yeah, and some people ask me that uh, about. In fact, there's uh, if you look on um, one of Andrew Breitbart's websites, I think BigGovernment.com, there's a spoof review. Where someone, uh, a conservative, his name is, uh, I can't remember his name now, um, but he poses as a communist and he's saying that all the, all the media is to the right of Nancy Pelosi. There, it must be conservative. It's a, a communist. Well, so I guess by this scale, you know, Nancy Pelosi kind of sets the end of the scale. But, you know, trust me, I, you know, I work in a academic environment at universities. There are lots and lots of people who are to the left of Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi. So it's kind of like I like to think of it, you know, the thermometer in my backyard only goes up to 120, but you could think of other thermometers that might go up to 500, you know, to, you know, things you might use in your oven, say. So in in theory you could have a, the scale go higher, you know, and I guess a communist would be 150 or 200 and then you could imagine John Birch society people who'd be less than 0, maybe a negative okay. 50, something like that. But yeah, my scale, yeah, it's like my thermometer in my backyard only goes from zero to hundred. So it only captures. It, it, may, it may not capture some of the very extreme people. So, and just on a side note, Professor, what's the difference between a liberal and a progressive? Oh, uh, you know, for the life of me, I, I I like to say a progressive is just a liberal times two. <laughs> that, that, that there's no, I don't know of any policy that they differ on. It's just that progressives are more ardent and, and want to go farther in that direction than any liberal. I, I like to think a, a progressive is just a liberal times two, a socialist is a liberal times three, and a communist is a liberal times four. Okay, okay. So well, I, see, now, you know, we think it's a name change, Professor, because liberals fell out of favor terribly, and nobody wants yeah. to be called that anymore, apparently, because they're ridiculed for that, so they come up with, well, I mean, I mean progressive is nothing new, but it's progress. It's a new name. Right, oh, exactly. You know, and, and, and I so, love... You know, I love. I think it's going to come back to, to bite them. Um, you know, I went to grad school in the late 1980s. And I had several left wing friends who would tell me, "No, I'm politically correct." Now they would say that, speaking literally, that I and my views are correct. And within just a few years, people started making fun of that. And now no one, everyone uses that in jest. They mean it as a term of derision. But they didn't mean that at first. The left wing, in all seriousness, would call themselves politically correct. I think something similar might happen with this word progressive. That eventually people are going to say, oh, that just shows how sanctimonious these people are, the ones who use that. Mm-hmm. Um, Bernard Goldberg may have had the, the best explanation. One of his books, he said, you know, I'm a conservative. What if I just decided, no, I'm, I like to call myself a visionary. That's my political label, a visionary. So that's basically what the progressives have done. Interesting. Yeah. Slant quotient, SQ. All right, now this seems far more subjective. Those in the media aren't going to fill out voter cards for you, Professor. So can right. you tell us how they how you came up with that? Um, well, now, now, even 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 if they did, now I, I should say there's you know there's some surveys that say they're all very very liberal, and I have to say I think that 
even those who have like a political quotient of like a Nancy Pelosi, I, I think they don't. They, they actually moderate their views a little bit when they're when they're reporting that they don't act as liberal as as they are in their heart. But uh, so the slant quotient tries to measure how they report. And um, here, here's an example of that. So I find that the slant quotient of the New York Times is a 74. Now, it also happens that the political quotient of Joe Lieberman is a 74. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that my method finds that the average New York Times article sounds about as liberal as the average Joe Lieberman speech. Okay, so both are at a 74. And I can give you more d details about how I do that. One, one method looks at, for instance, at think tank citation. So that 74 means that when the – New York Times is citing think tanks, left-wing, right-wing, centrist think tanks, that it picks a mix of those different political views that mirrors the same mix of think tanks that Joe Lieberman cites when he's on the Senate floor. Yes. L let me ask you about MSNBC. I don't see them um, on page 17 of all these media outlets, and that's interesting that's to me. Um, I, I just wonder if that was done on purpose because we know that MSNBC, the CEO there, uh, which uh, um, Jeffrey Il Ilmert, I believe is pronounced, has a Ilmert, very yeah. Yeah. he close relationship to Barack Obama. He's his jobs are there, and many people have always made the connection that MSNBC is a mouthpiece of the DNC in many ways because of General Electric's uh, you know willingness to you know the getting government contracts versus giving the Democratic Party lots of airtime here did you purposely omit them from your list well uh, no uh, what happened is that um just the the nature of this this um data gathering and the statistical analysis just takes a long time and uh, all my data uh I think the latest is like 2006, and most of it is in the early 2000s. And so um, at the time, MSNBC just wasn't that important a network. I, you know, I did like the 20 most important. And actually during but the early 2000s. Have, things have changed, yeah, Professor? Yeah, yeah. They were, remember, there were some, some people who were on Fox News. Greg Jarrett, for instance, used to be on MSNBC. Uh, um, Joe Scarborough. Well, no, he still is. On, on, he used to have a show in the evening. Um uh, like Michael Savage, the radio host, for for a short while had a a weekend show on MSNBC during the early 2000s. It was kind of moderate, almost even yeah. right leaning. It was only when um, Keith Olbermann uh, got on sometime, I think around 2006, 2007, uh, that it decided they. I think they made a decision just to move far left. And now here's you know the thought experiment. So even though I don't actually compute the slant quotient, in my view, at least the shows in the evening, Rachel Maddow and Ed Schultz, uh, they sound like left to, to me. Sometimes left of Nancy Pelosi. You know, they are often like criticizing Barack Obama for not being left wing enough. Barack Obama has a political quotient of 88. So I would put their shows, their slant quotient. Higher than 88, maybe higher than 100, they and they never have um, conservatives on. You know, Fox News, even like Bill O'Reilly, all the time will, will sure. interview uh, liberal guests. Uh, that's not true on MSNBC. And in fact, I remember an article we talked about a few weeks ago on the show where the uh, president of MSNBC was saying, "Hey, it's tough to get conservatives to come on to MSNBC." <laughs> Well, so, yeah, you know, true. Yeah, you know, we're doing I, the best that we can, he says. But, you know, it's interesting because when you talk about media, and I'm going through your book, it's 256 pages of just chock full of information. It's not one of those books you breeze through. You've got to slow down and read it because there's so much information in there. You do your job, uh, Professor, and I appreciate that. Oh, thank but you. you have a, a, a curious thing. And Fox comes onto the scene, they fill a niche. As we're looking yeah. back on this, there's a niche yeah. because there's a general understanding or a belief that there's a lack of not just um, credible middle of the road objective news, but that the, it, it's heavily slanted in one direction. And so Fox News comes on fair and balanced, they say, which mm. instead of shaming the other cable divisions and other news uh, divisions into being more objective and tend to, trending more toward the center, it almost released them, it seems to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's ironic. It's kind of interesting in that sense that it almost allowed them to kind of be free to 
to be what they wanted to be, which actually I appreciate more. I would, this kind of sense, talk to us about this idea that there is such a thing as objectivity. Right. Yeah, so I think that um well so my my point in the book, you know, some some people say, Oh, um you know, the the key of bias, as long as it's true, it it's it's unbiased. And but my point in the book is is that basically just about with any news outlet it is very, very hard to find false statements. Just about everything they report mm. is true in in my view. And and, and so if, if if you have that, the problem is though that there are some true facts that liberals want you to learn about, just about with any topic. And then there will also be some true facts that conservatives want you to know about. And what's going on is that the liberal reporters, in my judgment, as I show in the book, they are not giving us the whole spectrum. They are giving us disproportionately the facts that liberals want you to hear. And so, and I'd argue that that is not – that is not unbiased. That is, if you were a moderate voter you, and you learned exactly all the facts and all the facts you weren't getting, you'd be mad about that. You'd say, "Yeah, you are not presenting the whole truth as I want to hear it." And so, in my view, if you if you want to be completely biased by by, by my definition, you've got to give the facts that a moderate voter would want you to give them, and also that a moderate voter would choose. That it's, it's the idea is that it's got to come from someone who's not trying to sell you a bill of goods. I think we all kind of know that our moderate friends kind of aren't in the interest of like trying to persuade us either way, but meanwhile our left-wing and right-wing friends are. So uh, that's my the, the idea of the book, that yes, there is this definition, of, and this is what I mean by, by unbiased journalism. Well, certainly the left cannot be happy with the conclusion of your study, because not only with media, but virtually everything that uh, the left represents, they always want to claim victimization. I mean, you, you go down left-wing blogs, they really believe that the media is hard right. <laughs> you know, and, and so right. and, as laughable as that is, but you your study was attacked by Media Matters, um, yeah. Mr. Gross Close. Any merit to their claims? Uh, no, let's see. What was it? <laughs> what they, I've looked at that. There's enough people that did it. They, they you know, had some criticisms. They said well, what they did. Here's what. Um, so they haven't uh, actually critiqued my book yet. But the, what they did critique was an earlier peer-reviewed article that forms one of the chapters of this book. And I wrote that. It was yes. a peer-reviewed article. It was published in Quarterly Journal of Economics. And what they did is in that article, my co-author and I, we had a, a few pages where we said, here are some potential criticisms of our method. And we would say, here's a sentence, this is the potential criticism, and then we would explain, here's why it's not. And Media Matters, what they typically would do is just take that first sentence. So it wasn't even original, their criticism. It was like my own criticism of my own work. They just didn't give you the other part. And, for instance, uh, one thing I, I showed that, well, in this data, it was a weird year. Uh, Mitch McConnell was um, citing the ACLU uh, positively because the ACLU came out against the McCain-Feingold campaign finance mm -hmm. reform. So it turns out that – so by my method, ACLU looked like a, a moderate organization because conservatives were, were citing at that time. So you know, the media matter said, oh, this is the, shows the problems with the methods. And you know, what they got is what – I actually admitted in the in the in the book, and then I said, "Well, okay, but if this is a problem, let's just take ACLU data. Let's completely remove it from from the book." And when you do it, actually, what happened is the media look even more liberal than I reported. Now, Media Matters doesn't mention that, so it was a series of things that they did, and then on top of that. This was an article published in a peer-reviewed journal. This is the the editors of the journal were all professors at Harvard. As what happens in academic publishing, if you have a major error and if someone discovers it, they can just write in, write up a little report, a note, send it to the journal, and they can get it uh, get it published. If Media Matters really had something damning about that that study, they could publish that in Quarterly Journal of Economics. They, they haven't even sent it. I I, I know I would have. They would have. The, Quarterly Journal of Economics would have sent it to me, so I, I know that didn't happen. So, uh, no, they they attacked it, but uh, no, there's no okay. real criticism there. 
Oh, we're talking to uh, Tim Grossclose, uh, author of the book Left Turn, How Liberal Media Bias Distorts the American Mind. I need one quick PQ score update that I think our audience would be very interested in, and that is the PQ score of Ronald Reagan. You know, I, I don't have that because he never served in Congress. Now, ah. uh, you know, so uh, <laughs> my, my guess is, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm not sure he would quite be as conservative as Michelle Bachman, but I think he'd be at least as conservative as John Boehner. Boehner is a, a ten, and uh, so my guess would be something like a five. Um, ah. Yeah, so definitely Jim Dement's a four. I think Dement would mm-hmm. call himself a Reagan conservative. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, yeah, so for, you know, I have another academic. It turns out presidents sometimes will make statements on congressional votes, and that's on my list of things to do, an academic study that would give presidential PQ scores. So uh, ask me again, uh, <laughs> maybe in three or four years. I, I hope okay. you have that. Well, you know what? We'll take that from you as an educated guess. I think that, <laughs> that's pretty good. Right but I'm there. very confident. It'd be somewhere around <laughs> five, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I want to, before we move on, I want to talk about the modern atmosphere, the, the modern media market right now. But, but before I do, I want you to tell us, and one of the things I appreciate, and you were just talking to Frank about how you take on the liberal arguments in your book. And that's important because it is a big debate. It's a bitter debate, actually, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people get into it. But you do it constantly in your book. You say, okay, this person has an issue with us. This is, we take it. We, under, we, we see it. We respect that disagreement. Here's our answer to the disagreement. And I want, and you start out right away, and I want you to tell us, if you could quickly, the story, and you use the name of Byron B. Bright in there. Yeah, yeah. But this kind of story that is the seed that starts this thought in your mind that this might be something that you want to do, to yeah. write about. Right, right. Yeah, so this was uh, – so I'd written the original article, the peer-reviewed article – uh, I was with my co-author Jeff Milo, and so we get criticized all over the place. It, 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 just all these left-wing blogs, and I think most of them hadn't even r- read the whole article. They just saw the conclusion and said, "Oh, we must attack it." And then there's a tactic among the left that, um, and I swear the, the left will, will disagree with me, but I swear it's true that they attack you personally much more than conservatives will attack liberals. And there's this one tactic. They always try to say, oh, you must be funded by these right-wing organizations. That's, that's <laughs> the reason. And so it had happened that a long time ago uh, I had a position as a the national fellow at the Hoover Institution visiting for one year, um, which had nothing to do with my politics. It turns out they had 20 national fellows. Uh, most of them were liberal, so uh, they weren't picking people by their politics. But anyway – um, part of my salary that year was paid by the Hoover, Inst- Hoover Institution. Most of it still was paid by Stanford University, where I was a professor. But uh, regardless, so I was paid some money by Hoover Institution. This was before I even started the media bias thing, So uh, the, the project. So um, Eric Alterman did this uh, usual tactic, just says, okay, let's see where you know he's been a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Oh, he's been paid this money. And so he wrote this article. His title was Rigging the Numbers. So he tried to insinuate that, that I, I fudged all these things, and he did this, insinuated that it was because I had been invested in by these right-wing organizations. Well, so a colleague of mine at UCLA who, who's, who's liberal um, – and we really respect each other, even though we, we get in political arguments all the time. I've known him for 20 years. We're almost like brothers, and we fight almost like brothers. But we, after the argument, we really like each other and uh, still get along. So, um, But he sees this, and it made him angry about this. This was a personal attack. had no evidence of what he was saying. And eventually, he, uh, I didn't, he didn't tell me about it. He decided to write an email to Eric Alterman saying how wrong Eric Alterman was and said this, this personal nature of what you did this was vicious um and just untrue he had no evidence and um he cc'd me and i I talked about it that i had to kind of fight back tears even when i started reading it and uh thanked him anyway made it the uh the subject of the introduction just how i I want to tell the left how that tactic you you know i know it seems like an easy debate point winner but it, it kind of backfires that people can see through it. I think even moderates are seeing that is vicious and untrue, and, and uh, that doesn't help your cause. Good, good Lord. Uh, Professor Close, we are 
we are hurtling toward a 2012 election that is going to be full of that. I think so, yeah. I yeah. believe it's going to be the most bitter, dark, angry, uh, malicious campaign uh, ever because of the uh, because of what's at stake here, too. Um, we've dealt that uh, with that for a long time. And I want to ask you here about the influence of the Internet because I really think that that has had a, a change on things. We have the 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 many argue that we're no more free from bias than we have been in the past when, when there were fewer outlets for information um now we kind of self select our news sources professor choosing right. to visit sites and read writers to the exclusion of other perspectives some has some would say the internet kind of has flung open the doors and destroy the kind of monopoly that the left had on the media. And in some ways it has. But I'm kind of noticing here that those doors seem to be kind of closing a little bit, and we close them ourselves. Do you see that? Do you? What is your thought about the Internet's influence on exactly what you talk about? I think you're right. Yeah, I think there are things like um, – I can't remember exactly what happened, but Ed Schultz, uh, the commentator on MSNBC, on his show about two weeks ago, he had something where he really distorted uh, this issue, and he had some video, and he cut off the video oh, at this one point. Yeah. And Perry then, being a racist or something? I, that's right. That's what it was, yeah. <laughs> and then all he had to do was look on YouTube, though. People had posted the whole video. And all, that didn't happen. Uh, Twenty years ago, you, you could have gotten away with that. You know, the three big networks, they could have just posted that, and no one would have discovered that. Another thing, here's – if I can tell another study. So um, it, UCLA happens to be a pretty liberal place, but uh, they've got me. I'm, I'm not. And there also happens to be a, uh, a grad student in my department. Her name is Emily Eakins, E-K-I-N-S, who saw this talk about how – People were calling the Tea Party racist, and she decided, I'm going to gather some data on this. She just went to some of the rallies, took pictures of every single sign she could find at the rallies, posted them on a website, and just showed here's the data. And said, like, th there's really none of them that, that are racist at all. I mean, there's even certain things, some, like, you could. Only a few things you could even call even close to racist, like someone might say, oh, somewhere in Kenya, the village lost their idiot. She said, okay, even if you call that racist, only like 3% of the signs were that. Most of them, just the vast majority, were about limited government. And as you say, like you know, 20 years ago, I don't, I'm not sure she could have done that because she, you know, the, the key was that she could put it on this website and let everyone see those pictures for themselves. So. Um, I see that and things like um, the Media Research Center. That so everyone is ready to pounce on someone if they're not if they're going to distort these things. So um, I think you're right. I think the internet, um, blogs, and YouTube. I think will help things. Right, right. Well, you write in your book. The problem is that our political views often determine which media outlets we consider trustworthy and untrustworthy. Thus, our thinking is circular. Our political views influence where we go for news, which influence our political views, which further influences where we go for news, and so on. Uh, Mr. Groskos, are, are, is, is the problem, though, with the Internet the fact that many of us live in a bubble, that we go to the same trusted websites over and over, and maybe sometimes we don't spread ourselves far enough? I mean, the most of us live uh in this bubble? There's something to that, although I want to tout an, an academic paper. It's by two economists at the University of Chicago. Their names are uh, Matt Genskow and Jesse Shapiro, and they actually analyzed that. They looked, they got data about where people are looking at, and, and there is a lot of truth to that, that people are just kind of staying in their own bubble, but they analyzed the same kind of segregation segregation that, that happens uh, on websites, and they analyze the same aspect within neighborhoods and in the workplace. And so it turns out our neighborhoods are just about – are actually more segregated politically than these internet sites are. Mm. So you know, oh. if you look at – yeah, so you know, if you look at you know the people who look at FoxNews.com, there are you know lots mainly conservative, but it's not as – monolithically conservative is you know like lots of conservative neighborhoods and same thing with the workplace so i'm not sure it's as bad as as people say and then the other thing there still are moderates out there 
And and that's where all the action is. You know, if you want to win an election, you've got to convince the moderates, and the moderates are still getting a variety of places. Yeah, and, and you notice the most popular websites on the internet are not political websites. All right, and you know what? A Drudge Report, although people call that conservative, I actually find it uh, pretty centrist, and I think lots and lots of centrists are going there. Lots of liberals are, and not only that, and lots of journalists themselves actually go to the Drudge Report. So uh, there yeah. are some things out there that uh, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think I, the, the the left has ever forgiven Drudge for breaking the Monica Lewinsky story. I think. See, that's, no, right, right. that's what that is because there are too many stories on Drudge Report. That savage Republicans, conservatives. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I thought that was a curious charge, considering that th- this is a, this is the kind of gumshoe I'm looking for, right here. Oh, uh, right, right. The, 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 what you mean, sir? That um, the Drudge is about he, Clinton, or the... well, no, that he brings in information from all over the place. Oh, exactly. Listen, exactly. We're political junkies. Uh, I, you know, I think we're a small segment of the community. Sometimes we get to thinking that everybody's reading what we're reading, and we should all be outraged together in this clarion call of revolution and and anger. But but that's not the case often. And and on and on Drudge Report, it's it's kind of the uh, kind of the crack that we're looking for a lot of time because it brings in salacious political news from all over the place. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, he is he is amazing at going out looking far and wide and finding. And so is Andrew Breitbart, who yes. who's come onto the scene, who's been incredible. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I've re- just recently read both of their biographies, and uh, uh, one thing about both of them, they are just news junkies. They are passionate about finding news, and, and they are really, really good at it. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, Drudge Report, and I don't think I think Drudge is actually trying to sell himself as a centrist on this. He is getting stuff from the New York Times, Washington Post, kind of liberal outlets, mm-hmm. as well as sometimes from things like Washington Times, the conservative outlets. Yeah, yeah, I remember I remember 2004 election. Drudge was the first one to break the story about the the exit polling numbers of the 2004 election as they were breaking, saying that a lot of that that a lot of people were saying that these numbers are way off right there as of the, uh, the media. Yeah, I, do you remember that when the media was trying to use those exit polls and a lot of people, of course, said that they were speculating or trying to, to depress Republican vote later on in the evening. Of the 2004 election, and and Drudge was the one that broke that. I thought that was a great story. Uh, I remember that. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, the mainstream is moving into the internet. They all have their sites. New York Times subscription service, Wall Street Journal, who we find through your book, is not actually a conservative for as much as they are maligned as being such. But the news pages, uh, yeah, yeah. Ex- ex- exactly, news pages. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and frankly, that's a confusion or a contortion that we hear a lot from those that challenge you, is that they will say, well, Fox News is conservative because of O'Reilly and Hannity. Wall Street Journal is 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 conservative because of the editorial page. Well, it's a very different thing here, and trying to sift between the two and say how news is delivered has a whole lot to do. And those catchwords, the phrases they use, as you use with your SQ um, uh, qualifications on there, is a, is, is a big. There are triggers that we have as those who follow uh, news, professor, about how a reporter frames an issue. And I look for those all the time. I may not, I may not consciously do that, but subconsciously, when I see a way that a, a, a reporter frames an issue, I know right away where he's coming from, and I'm instantly either skeptical or I tend to trust him. Right, right, right. Him yeah, her. and it's, and it's. I think, yeah, like you said, I think a lot of that language they use is just subconscious. That, um, uh, yeah, I just recently wrote an op-ed about this article in the New York Times magazine that talked about they called it twin reduction, which was this form of abortion where if a woman decided she only wanted to have one kid, even though she's pregnant with two, um, they wouldn't call it killing the other fetus. They called it expunging or exterminating. And I'm sure, though, that with the, I, I don't even think the, the, the journalist intended to try to distort things, but I think just within her circle of friends, that that's what words they use. They would not call it killing, and that's, you know, without even thinking about it, she would use the, the words that liberals would use. And so fortunately, they, they do that. that. That allowed me, gave me one of my methods that I could use to judge the slant quotient of different outlets. Mm-hmm. We have been talking to 
uh, Tim Grossclose. Um, Mr. Grossclose, last question of the night here, um, and that is, uh, you know, now that we have the data in, what is it that you want the media to do with the evidence you're presenting, uh, their particular their bias? Do you want them to admit it, or do you want them to tame themselves? I wish they would read my book. I would love it if just some journalists, at least the, the first half, just where I talk about some of these things, you know, just reporting only true statements. That's not enough. It's the things that you're omitting. Uh, I would love it if they would do that. The second thing, I would love if they would start being more transparent about their views. And in the last chapter of my book, I say that I've spent 10 years studying politicians. The more I studied politicians, the more I respected them. The more the next, I spent the next eight years studying journalists, the more I studied them, the less I respected them. I said my, my uh, prescriptions for the media are for journalists to act more like politicians – and then I write, I promise I'm not joking when I say that. But I say no journalist, if you ask them, like, you know, what's your views on partial birth abortion? Who are you going to vote for in the next election? They will never tell you that. They just keep these things secret. Meanwhile, could you imagine a politician doing that? Say, so what's your stance on partial birth abortion? You know, if the politician said, oh, I'm, I'm an objective lawmaker, I can't tell you, we'd vote them out of office in a minute. And so I wish that the journalists could, you know, start taking some – cues from the politicians and start acting a little bit more like them, especially just on the transparency of their views. Outstanding. Professor Tim Gross Close, Left Turn, Our Media Bias Distorts the American Mind. Thank you so much, sir, for what you do. We'll be looking for your next book. I think you'll find it right here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. See you. Friends, I'll tell you, go to his site. We put it in the chat room. Um, go over there and check it out. There is so much information over there. And if you care about how the message is delivered, which I think is huge, such a, like I talked about earlier, we're cruising toward 2012. It's going to be so important how we frame uh, these issues that we're dealing with. Rick Perry being attacked right now, Bill Keller comes out in the New York Times, wants to talk about his religiosity, how dangerous that is. The left is, is, um, is going to be moving um, – with an aggressive stance on how we interpret those issues, those positions that he take as they pertain to those things that we hold dear to ourselves. It's not just economics. I think social issues are a big part of it, too, as well. How the media frames that, where you go for your news, and, and if you trust the news that you're getting, it's all a big part of understanding the country that we're in right now. Who is the American? What does the American represent? What are we willing to stand up for and fight here, too? It's great. Uh, it's a great book. To, like I said, 256 pages, chock full of information. Frank? Yeah, buddy. Um, great interview once again. And, you know, when our good friend um, Regular Ron finds out that John McCain is more conservative than Ron Paul, I think he's going to lay an egg. <laughs> okay? All right? So there you go. Ron Paul, 31.8. That's amazing. Joe Scarborough. Okay, is at sixteen point four is more of a conservative than Rod Paul. That's amazing to me. <laughs> what a great book! What a great study! I love how he takes all these great politicians. Well, not great politicians, but all these names of people that are in politics breaks them down uh, by numerical number. You could compare them where they are, um, buddy. I think this list is not only going to make the left mad. I think it's going to make a lot of conservatives mad, especially those Ron Paul people we keep talking about. I'm telling you, when I took the test, uh, I was at 12.4. Yeah. Okay, well, I was at 12.4, and I think, you know what, okay. And then Frank tells me you're like a five or something. and I'm a three, I'm, buddy. I'm a no, three. I've so. got my friends calling me up and telling me they're, you know, <laughs> in the negative. And I'm like, what, what are you, a militia member? Are you running through <laughs> yeah. the forest? That's all well, I'm in Utah, so, I mean, there you <laughs> oh, go. that's right. <laughs> and he's got a great story about Utah as well in there, up in the northern Utah, but they're trying to find the most conservative member. It is very interesting. Again, if you take it seriously, if you take it seriously about how information is delivered in this country, well, we do too. That's why we bring on a man like Professor Tim Gross Close, because it matters, friends. Always it matters about how you get the information. Regardless if you think you're getting the truth, I'm telling you, you're not getting the truth. You're not getting the whole truth. I don't know that you're ever getting the whole truth, Frank. I don't know if that's yeah. possible. I don't know if there's such a thing. <laughs> I know there's no such thing as objective news. Okay? Yeah. But with the Internet, and, and as we talked about with him, the Internet, we tend to self-select. We tend to kind of read the news that we want. 
But if you've got the the curiosity, you will find and seek out positions that you disagree with, and in doing so, in cruising the Internet, you will find out information that will test you and test your belief and test your convictions on issues. And you need to continue to do that because that's where the growth is. Wisdom is not found in settling upon those uh, those kind of convictions you were born with. Test them. Constantly test them. Find out where you're at and how your life affects the decisions that you make. And you'll grow for that, and hopefully you'll you'll draw people toward uh, that wisdom that you've gained here. It's, that's what it's all about here. Political vindication. To vindicate the convictions that ensure liberty, respect life, and honor tradition. But not all convictions are equal. We've seen a nation that revolted for its freedom forget that we are born free and choose to abandon that dignity. We've learned that progressivism is in progress and liberalism has nothing to do with liberty. So we must fight to regain what we've lost, to live by the convictions that reject paternalism, embrace capitalism, and define man as more than a Pavlovian beast. Political Vindication Radio, every Tuesday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, where conservatives Frank and Shane talk politics and interview best-selling authors and activists. It's two hours of some of today's brightest minds discussing culture, history, and politics. This nation cannot remain great if its people aren't. That's why we're here every Tuesday. We've got to bring more than hope and regret into the future. Political Vindication Radio. It's where patriots meet.